So thank you very much, Marcus, for the kind and generous in introduction, and um, also a very warm welcome from my side to everyone who is online and on, on site. So differentiated integration and the future of Europe, that's the topic tonight. Um, when the European Commission published its white book on the future of Europe three years ago, differentiated integration, or how they called it, those who want more, do more, was one of the five scenarios the Commission outlined. Um, simply put, differentiated integration means that not all member states participate equally in all EU policies. Uh, that's what we call internal differentiation. But it also means that non-member states may participate selectively in some of the EU's policies. It is uh, probably fair to say that uh, differentiated integration was not the Commission's favorite scenario. But it has gained at least verbal support from uh, the French president, the German chancellor, uh, the leaders of the traditional engine of European integration. And importantly for academia, the European Commission decided to generously fund research on differentiated integration. So um, this year we um, celebrate the 250th birthday of Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Edel, uh, who once famously said, the hour of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk. Of course, he didn't refer to philosophy, but I think we can um, uh, assume that political science is not any different. So um, it may well be that we are beginning to understand better why and how differentiation has influenced and facilitated European integration, in particular during the past 30 years. But is that knowledge still relevant for shaping the future of Europe in vastly changing circumstances? The European Union has gone through a series of deep crises for the past 10 years that have tested its most cherished and also most differentiated achievements of the 1990s and the 2000s. So uh, the Euro, uh, the Schengen area, and an Eastern enlargement based on shared liberal democratic values and norms, uh, so far for internal differentiation. And compared to the, uh, to the benign and democratizing post-Cold War international environment of the European Union, it is now facing an autocratizing and hostile geopolitical context both East and West, and that is challenging external differentiation. So is differentiated integration, again, the answer to these crises and challenges? This will be the core question of my talk tonight. I will start by drawing a rather positive picture of what differentiation has done for European integration in the past. Yet, uh, I will also point out that this success was based on favorable conditions for differentiated integration during uh, this period. Looking at the current crises and challenges of European integration, these conditions may have changed fundamentally. So the, the heyday of differentiated integration might therefore be over in practice when it has only started to attract so much attention in theory. So looking at uh, the first slide, uh, which shows you the number of uh, differentiated treaty articles that are not valid in all member states as, as let's say, the most important measure of how differentiated the uh, European Union has become. Um, so why? Why do we see this picture, uh, this trajectory of differentiated integration over time? So there is a, I, I would submit, quite consensual explanation for that. Yeah, that is not really contested in the literature on 
uh, differentiated integration. And uh, that explains differentiated integration as a response uh, to an increasing heterogeneity of EU membership and um, the legal or political need for consensus um, to overcome uh, integration deadlock. And um, both of these conditions have to come together. I mean, if you have a, uh, an extremely heterogeneous uh, membership, but you can solve conflict through majority voting. Yeah, you can still get a lot of things done, of course, by um, um, outvoting uh, quite a few of the member states. If you have consensus-oriented decision making, but you have a very homogeneous membership, con consensus is not really uh, blocking the way uh, to um, into creation because of the homogeneity, uh, member states will have similar preferences and capacities. It's, it's the combination of both. Uh, sticking to a consensus-oriented decision-making machine at a time when preferences and capacities become more heterogeneous, yeah, that um, creates the need, I would say, for differentiated integration. Now, um, to uh, provide a very simple, stylized narrative, European integration in the 1950s started with a small group of rather similar states in the geographic core of Western Europe who shared a consensus on economic integration. Since then, however, the widening and deepening of European integration has undermined this homogeneity and consensus. With every round of enlargement, the membership of the EU has become more diverse uh, and diverse in very different ways, uh, which adds to the problem. So in the Northern enlargement of 1973, and again in the EFTA enlargement of 1995, the EU admitted new members that were consolidated democracies with a high capacity to participate in the internal market and its integrated policies. But this group of countries, uh, in contrast to the original members, was quite skeptical about the further deepening of integration beyond the market. Then again, in the southern and eastern enlargements of the European Union, the EU admitted new democracies, much less affluent and with weaker state capacity. Um, they were not against further deepening, they even demanded it, especially in terms of European solidarity and redistribution, but um, had less ca capacity to actually deal uh, with the demands, the exigencies of the internal market and uh, the EU's policies. So, um, so the, uh, let's say the, the, the core members of uh, the EU were basically flanked by groups of countries on both sides of the extreme. They are so stretching um, uh, the uh, EU in two opposite directions. Now, as we can see on this, on this picture, uh, each enlargement has had quite direct and uh, visible effects on differentiated integration. Yeah, so, Everywhere where you see an ENL, that's one of the enlargement rounds. You can you can see the the first um, um, the first bump in this line was the northern enlargement. Uh, then again, an increase with the southern enlargement um, uh, again in 1995 with the EFTA enlargement. Yeah, so uh, clearly in this line, it's the enlargements that created additional uh, differentiated integration over time. Um, but we can also see that uh, these enlargement effects um, have been temporary. Yeah? So after a, a few years, uh, the amount of differentiations in the treaty articles go, go down again, return to the uh, pre-enlargement uh, level. Um, so what drives uh, this um, accession based differentiation? Well, it's mainly an attempt of old member states to postpone the perceived costs of enlargement into the future, and especially in the case of poorer 
new member states. So uh, we all know the restrictions to free movement, to constrain migration from poorer new member states that we've uh, seen uh, with each um, Eastern enlargement round. We've always had res res restrictions to, uh, for new member states to participate uh, in one of the most costly policies of the EU, which is the common agricultural policy that already happened with Southern enlargement, happened again in Eastern enlargement. Uh, we see an exclusion of new member states, especially poorer new member states, from particularly demanding and risky policies such as EMU and Schengen, where new member states first need to prove their ability to meet the criteria. Uh, but it's, 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 it's not just ex excluding countries that you don't trust to meet the criteria and implement the provisions, it's also giving new member states more time to, uh, to adapt to some of the demanding EU standards and rules, for instance, in EU environmental policy, which these new member states only have to apply uh, a few years down the road. But as I said, uh, our finding is in, uh, it's temporary, it's, it's, it's really, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, a way to smoothen uh, the accession process on average, after seven years or so, new member states reach the same level of differentiation as the old member states. So that is, that is one important part of the story. Um, the diversity of member state preferences and capacities became even more relevant when integration deepened considerably beyond the internal market in the 1990s and 2000s. And again, we can we can see that in this in this picture. So that was when integration went beyond uh, market integration to uh, core state powers, a concept I don't have to explain here, as in EMU justice and home affairs. So that came to, it also came together with an increase in the powers of supranational actors like the ECB or the European Parliament, a move to qualified majority voting, and that. Um, uh, provoked uh, resistance, let's say, in the other group of new, at that time not entirely new member states beyond the original core, the northern member states with a strong preference for national self-determination and continued state autonomy. But it also uh, it additionally created concerns among integration-friendly original member states who feared that poorer member states with weaker state capacity and lower governance quality would undermine uh, the uh, European Monetary Union, Economic and Monetary Union, or the area of freedom, security, and justice. So um, uh, the, uh, the movement of the European Union to go beyond the internal market into these core state powers um, uh, created two movements. One is opt-outs for countries who were unwilling to integrate more deeply, such as the UK and Denmark, who use champions of differentiated integration, but who could have blocked further integration with their vetoes. Yeah, so basically giving them an opt-out was a way to buy off the potential vetoes that they could use, either in the intergovernmental negotiations or as a result of uh, national referendums. And sometimes, as in Schengen, the EU also had to go out of the treaty framework to conclude an intergovernmental agreement um, to circumvent this kind of veto threat. And uh, in, in contrast to the enlargement-based differentiations, these are durable because they are based on, they are not based on basically gaining time for new member states to, uh, to adapt to the European Union, but they are based on fundamental conflict about what the European Union should be and where it should go. And then uh, what, what added to this uh, was the, ex the exclusion of countries deemed unable to integrate more deeply. So here you see the Eurozone outs, countries initially excluded from, from Schengen, but with the promise of admission once they fulfill the conditions. So both the, uh, the temporary exclusion of new and comparatively poor member states and the durable opt-outs of comparatively wealthy mainly northern member states have driven the trajectory of differentiated integration that you can see on this on this slide 
it was it was basically driven by the necessity to find consensual agreements on widening and deepening beyond the market integration of wealthy European countries. But I would argue that uh, differentiation has mainly tracked general progress in integration. And on the next slide, um, you can actually see this. Now, here we uh, do not simply show the number of treaty articles that are differentiated, but um, we relate that number to the increasing number of member states in the EU and the increasing number of policies integrated in the EU. And what we can see here now is you, you don't see anymore, let's say, an upward, uh, uh, in, an increasing process of more and more differentiation, but it's actually a stationary process. So the current level of differentiated integration in the treaties is about the same as it was when the European Union started, if you control uh, for the increased number of member states and the increased number of, of, policy, of, of, of policies. So um, I think what this picture shows us is that differentiation has been used as um, some kind of a, a lubricant yeah, for um, integration. It has been necessary for the European Union to achieve its progress in integration um, under conditions of higher heterogeneity, but it's still, it, it's, it, it is not a process of ever looser union where um, uh, we see an unraveling of uniform in, uh, uh, integration over, over time. So we can, we can easily say that without differentiated integration, the European Union would not be where it is today. It would be a very different um, institution. Uh, if it hadn't been for differentiated integration, we wouldn't have the Euro, we wouldn't have Schengen, we would have probably a slower enlargement, maybe even a, uh, uh, a more restrictive membership of the European Union. And it is it, it's important to keep in mind that in this um, uh, in, in this period, differentiation has always been combined with more integration. Yeah? So differentiation does not mean that um, uh, you uh, disintegrate in the European Union. It just means, it means that you integrate further, just not with everybody on board. But let's say the, the net effect is clearly still a positive integration effect in this in this case. Uh, in, in addition, as I've pointed out, most differentiations have been temporary. Uh, it's, it's really been a process mainly of multi-speed Europe as a result of enlargement, uh, plus uh, some um, additional uh, durable um, um, differentiations. But uh, let's say the, the EU has, I mean, the, the, the way differentiated integration has, has worked is that the core countries, though, that are fully integrated in all policy areas uh, is a very inclusive group. It's the largest group of member states. It's an, it's an open group of member states. Yeah, so um, uh, countries, uh, if they are willing and able to, um, can easily join this core group over time, even if they are initially excluded from some policies. So uh, overall, I would say we've seen a, a, very, um, a, a very positive um, development uh, that differentiation has brought for the European Union in the in the past. So why not just continue this process in the future as the EU expands its membership further, moves into new policy areas, and fixes and deepens the policies that it already has. After all, uh, if you look at the European Union today, there is still an overwhelming case for differentiation. Heterogene heterogeneity, diversity is as high as ever and probably even higher uh, as it had been before. Uh, populism, for instance, increases heterogeneity about integration preferences in the European Union. Um, now, in the, in the new geopolitical environment, we see also that member states differ hugely regarding their geopolitical interests 
and concerns. And uh, the EU crisis has exposed default lines among the member states when it comes to fiscal policy, migration policy, the rule of law. So heterogeneity is probably higher than it was ever before. And if it is co correct to say that differentiated integration is a response to this heterogeneity, and by the way, of course, the EU hasn't given up its consensus-oriented policies where treaty changes need uh, unanimous agreement among our member states and domestic ratification, which is more difficult than ever to uh, achieve in, in the European Union. It is clear, yeah, I mean, if the EU wants to move ahead, it seems clear that it can only do so in a differentiated way. And that is, of course, also clearly, for instance, uh, behind uh, President Ma Macron's advocacy of differentiated integration. I think he's the European leader that has come out strongest in favor of differentiated integration as a prerequisite for the EU to move forward. But um, I would submit that the EU is in a completely different institutional situation now and at a different stage of integration as in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, and uh, here I want to emphasize that differentiated integration is not simply a response to demand, but it also requires the right supply conditions to come about. Yeah? So if, if uh, differentiated integration only responded to demand uh, based on, inter on heterogeneous integration preferences and capacities, we would probably see a lot more differentiation today than we already see, and we would also see a lot more in the future. But what are these supply conditions that I now need to introduce to explain why this demand is unlikely to be met? So one, one condition is critical size. Yeah, I mean, uh, to put it simply, it doesn't make sense yeah, to move ahead uh, with one group of countries if it's just one or two countries and, and one or two small countries. There needs to be a critical mass for this um, uh, institutional choice to make sense. And it has to do um, with all kinds of economies of scale and transaction costs that you incur if you differentiate. But that's probably the least troublesome or difficult condition. Another one is, is the, the uh, recurring problem of externalities, which you always have when you create two groups of countries with different rules. Um, that, that's always the concern, yeah, that, that one of the groups benefits uh, from the other's lower or higher level of integration. And if, if these ex externalities uh, um, get too high, um, they are a major uh, obstacle to differentiated integration. So we distinguish positive and negative externalities here. Positive externalities are also known as cherry picking or free riding of outsiders. So that a vanguard group of countries is unlikely to move ahead with more integration if those countries that remain outside benefit from it and maybe benefit from it more than those that invest the extra costs of creating a public good uh, for the for the in insiders um, and uh, without having to share these these costs that could also be negative externalities so a group of countries joins together and uh, regulates a policy in a way that uh, creates costs for those that do not join but even in, in, that, in that situation, we would not see stable differentiation because that creates a high incentive for those remaining outside to join as soon as possible in order uh, to also um, benefit. Again, this is, a, uh, this is a perennial issue with differentiated integration and is a, is a major obstacle. But I think the most important point these days is uh, is, is really the, the issue at hand. It's, it's the problems that the EU uh, in its current stage needs to uh, deal with. And two uh, sorts of problems are, is, are specifically incompatible with 
uh, differentiated integration, and I call these um, constitutional problems and redistributive problems. So some issues are of such fundamental normative importance and regarded as indivisible and universal that differentiation is simply normatively inappropriate in the eyes of policymakers. And in the EU, that has to do a lot with human rights, the rule of law, and democracy. And it, is, it is just not to say um, legitimately um, applicable yeah, to let some countries have a lower or a, a substandard level of democracy or, or rule of law. Differentiation is also self-defeating, basically, if uh, burden sharing and solidarity are the purpose of integration or are, are required for a policy to move ahead. So a, a differentiated union in which those that need support are in one group um, and those that could provide the support are in a, in a, in a different group that yeah, just defeats that purpose. You need to bring both together for the policy to work. But if countries have their own, own choice, of course, those that would have to pay would like to remain outside and those that would benefit would like to integrate further. And it is, uh, and, and uh, this split yeah, just, just doesn't make, make sense. Finally, there's uh, institutional context also. Um, what we found in our research is that differentiated integration is easiest to agree upon as long as um, uh, you are in early stages of uh, a, a, a policy integration and policy integration is still low. Um, that has to do with the fact that uh, it is it is easier to um, uh, it is it is easier to uh, to uh, to agree on differentiated integration if the two groups, um, insiders and outsiders, are not too interdependent yet. Yeah? So can easily split without major costs for, for both. Um, if you haven't created common supranational institutions yet, because in supranational institutions have an interest of keeping everything together, and the European Parliament, European Commission, European Court of Justice, they are quite skeptical of uh, differentiated integration as institutions. Um, so uh, once you've moved uh, further up in the development of integration, you have created supranational institutions, you have decision-making rules that make it harder to split up, you have created a lot of endogenous interdependencies among the uh, member states, it becomes more difficult to, uh, to, to agree on uh, differentiated integration. So these are, let's say, the abstract con con conditions, supply conditions I wanted to mention. And um, uh, in, in the final part of the talk, I'd like to, to run you quickly through some of the major policies that we're facing now um, in order to show that uh, these are characterized in, exactly uh, by these obstacles to differentiated integration. So um, when, we, when we look at these policies, the general observation is differentiated integration would be technically, uh, technically possible. Yeah. You, could, you could easily think of a way to institutionalize um, differentiated integration in these areas, but uh, it is either inappropriate, normatively, or dysfunctional uh, because the policy challenges refer to constitutional and redistributive issues. So let's start with enlargement, which has been one of the major drivers of multi-speed differentiation in the, in the past and facilitating the accession of new member states. Now, um, if enlargement has been one of the major push factors for differentiated integration, the news that you all know is uh, well there's not going to be enlargement in the in the foreseeable future that's come to a standstill with candidate countries in the western balkans and turkey stuck in accession negotiations and no credible accession candidates beyond that and the reason why they are stuck has to do precisely with these constitutional issues um, it is it is not as in the past 
basically lowering the costs of integrating these countries in some of the EU's policies. It's about their um, uh, failure to develop stable uh, democratic and uh, rule of law uh, systems, which are which the old member states regard as non-negotiable, as non-differentiable. If you if you like, and uh, actually the democratic backsliding we've seen in the Western Balkans and in, in Turkey has rather moved away these uh, uh, accession countries from fundamental standards that they would need to meet before you can even talk about the differentiated accession of these countries uh, to the European Union. Now, if, if, a, if accession is not on the agenda, of course, differentiated integration could still serve the common interests of both sides through external differentiation. So selective participation of non-members in the EU's policies. Would that maybe uh, be a alternative for accession countries that are unlikely to join in the foreseeable future? And um, here, here the point is, well, uh, these countries have already reached a level of participation in uh, the EU's policies um, uh, where there's very little that they could still advance further before becoming full, full members. Yeah? So they all have quite uh, sub substantial, deep association agreements with the European Union. Turkey is even in the customs union uh, with the EU. So there's, there's actually not much uh, that the EU could offer these countries below membership at the stage where they are, are already are. More importantly, any deepening of these policies, again, requires liberal economies, functioning rule of law systems that, uh, that these countries um, are not developing. The EU will be reluctant to deepen external differentiation with countries characterized by state capture of the economy and lack of judicial independence. So how about then um, those well-governed countries that do not want to become member states like the countries of the European economic area, like Norway, or um, as a non-DEA country, Switzerland. So here again, I don't think the future goes well for further external differentiation, because in the past, the EU had operated on the assumption that these countries would eventually join the European Union sooner or later, and that external differentiation was mainly a transition, a, a, a temporary phase in which the EU could be quite generous yeah, in letting these countries participate in its internal market and policies without really requesting um, uh, a strong uh, contribution or a, a strong commitment of these countries to uh, the integration process. Now, we now know that this assumption was wrong. And now the EU actually, we, we see the EU now putting emphasis on protecting the integrity of its internal market and preventing these countries from becoming permanent cherry pickers. And that, of course, has been reinforced by the Brexit experience uh, and uh, the perceived need in the European Union to demonstrate that leaving or remaining outside the European Union comes at a high price. Um, and uh, so uh, we clearly see in the Brexit negotiations that um, um, the EU requires uh, the selective participation and market and other policies only on the basis of a robust level playing field. And uh, in the current negotiations with uh, Switzerland, uh, the Swiss government also had to learn that um, any new sectoral agreements that the EU would be willing to adopt with Switzerland would be conditional on a reformed institutional framework, including the dynamic adoption of EU law and institutionalized and judicial dispute settlement arrangements. So here again, in this changing environment, external differentiation uh, is becoming um, more limited. Now let's move from the outside to the inside, internal differentiation. So here again, I mean, in external differentiation, the starting point is, um, um, Differentiated integration is, a, is, is great to um, facilitate the accession of new member states, 
if there are few candidates out there that could become uh, member states, differentiation really has no role to play. In internal differentiation also, uh, it has been great to kickstart new policies, uh, the integration of new policies in the European Union, but now there are actually quite few policies left that have not been integrated yet, or are only integrated at a low level. There are, of course, examples. Uh, defense policy is one, and we've seen that PESCO uh, is an area in which differentiated integration has indeed recently um, been um, advanced. Actually, health policy in the current situation might be another policy that uh, could work with differentiated integration if, for instance, several member states go ahead with joint procurement and joint stocks of medical su supplies. But that, of course, also here a, a strong incentive for uniform integration. Another policy that has been a strong candidate for differentiated integration has been taxation policy. Um, but this is actually an area where you have high heterogene heterogeneity, um, but because of the strong potential for externalities and cherry picking in taxation policies, uh, this is an area uh, where uh, several attempts of enhanced cooperation, like the financial transaction tax, have not really su su succeeded. <laughs> so let's. Uh, let's quickly look at the uh, at the major internal crises of the uh, that the European Union has faced: the euro crisis, the migration uh, crisis, the rule of law crisis, uh, which have um, exposed major heterogeneities, uh, be it between north and south, euro crisis, east and west in the migration crisis, and also mainly in the rule of law crisis. Um, so there, there, there is a general uh, agreement in the European Union uh, on, on major deficits and uh, a need for reform uh, in these policies. And we've seen major intergovernmental conflict and decision-making deadlock in these policies too. So it's, this seems to be the uh, perfect breeding ground uh, for differentiated integration. Um, and, and indeed, yeah, people have proposed differentiated integration to overcome this deadlock. There are proposals, um, even by, say, prominent scholars like Fritz Schaaf, for a two-tier eurozone. Uh, there have been proposals, more, let's say, more politically interested proposals for what's called flexible solidarity in asylum policy. And, um, uh, there have been also calls from Eastern European member states to treat judicial reform as a national issue rather than a European issue. And again, yeah, it would be technically feasible. You could have a rule of law mechanism where only willing member states sign up to. You could have an allocation regime for asylum seekers um, and risk sharing arrangements in the Eurozone that member states could voluntarily opt into or opt out from. But uh, none of these proposals has actually um, uh, come to be realized. And I will submit the, the reason why is because uh, of, for reasons of, of either appropriateness, solidarity, or ch cherry picking. Um, so in the rule of law, and civil rights crisis, um, this is not regarded as a suitable area for differentiated integration because it is regarded as an issue of universal and indivisible norms by their so, so, so supporters. Again, I mean, functionally speaking, you could do that. I mean, LGBTI free areas in Poland, state control of national media in Hungary create moral indignation, but they, they don't create ex externalities. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't in, 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 impinge on the right uh, of um, uh, minorities in Western Europe if they are treated badly in Poland. Um, to some extent, you could say that the independence of the judiciary creates externalities in the internal market, because the, the functioning of the internal market requires independent national courts. But I would say the, the main reason why um, why uh, uh, differentiated integration in this area is not possible really has to do with its constitutional value rather than with functional concerns. 
These functional concerns are much more important in the Eurozone and in migration policy. Um, so these are supranationally integrated policy with high interdependence. And in principle, differentiation could take two directions yeah, in, these, in these policies. Um, and which I call a plus and a minus option, or you could say it's differentiated integration or differentiated disintegration. Uh, so in the, in the plus option, you would see a small group of Eurozone countries to move ahead with uh, more integration beyond the existing level. In the minus option, you would see a small group of countries uh, uh, drop out from the current level of integration. So one option for the Eurozone minus, which has been proposed, yeah, would be to overcome the defects of the Eurozone by the exit of countries that fail to meet the stability criteria and are incapable of avoiding sovereign default. And, and the Brexit scenario came close to this. Um, it, it was considered in the Eurozone crisis, but rejected because of massive negative externalities due to the high financial interdependence in the in the eurozone so a eurozone minus because of the already very high uh, status of integration would have created massive economic disruption not only in states leaving the eurozone but there were fears of a domino effect if you started to um, uh, kick out one 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 country which would engulf at least all the southern member states would undermine trust in the permanence of the monetary union and invite ever more speculative attacks and it was also, uh, as a side note, seen as normatively inappropriate, at least outside the German finance ministry. Um, then there, there could, of course, be a Eurozone plus. So those willing to create stronger risk-sharing instruments may do so, um, including everything that has been discussed from um, um, unemployment insurance, bank deposit insurance to Eurobonds. But of course, risk sharing only makes sense if it includes first a large number of countries and second, countries with mixed risks. Yeah, otherwise, in insurances just don't work. Um, and so a, a Eurozone plus of southern member states would not be sufficient to stabilize its members in the future economic crisis. And a Eurozone plus of fiscally healthy northern countries would be neither necessary to stabilize its members nor helpful for stabilizing the south and similar in the schengen and dublin border and asylum policies the issue here again is burden sharing the reallocation of asylum seekers from the most affected frontline mediterranean and uh, northern destination countries so in analogy to eurozone minus schengen minus would mean the exit of countries unable or unwilling to meet their obligations as countries of first arrival and we've seen actually a de facto exit when overwhelmed Mediterranean countries stopped registering and controlling the movement of migrants. And Eastern member states uh, simply ignored uh, the allocation scheme uh, decided on by qualified majority in the uh, European Union. But we've seen also that this, these minus options were not viable. Yeah? It, it just led to cascading border closures and un uncontrolled migration to other countries. Um, close to unraveling in the Schengen area altogether. So here again, we, we see the negative externalities of this disrupting, reducing an already highly integrated policy area. Now, Schengen Plus would then again bring together only those frontline and destination countries that would benefit from reallocation. Um, and whereas Schengen Plus might provide for a fairer and more orderly distribution of migrants across the most affected countries, it would not lower their collective burden if transit and bystander countries remain outside. So here we have an issue of positive externalities. And I mean, if you just look at the discussions we've had after the fire on uh, uh, Lesbos, uh, really speaking only about a handful or just a few migrants to be relocated, even those countries willing to do so were very much concerned that this would be interpreted as a sign by the others uh, that they would not have to contribute. So even, even willing member states 
uh, were concerned about these positive externalities, and in the end, um, the um, result was minimal. So let me con conclude at this point. Uh, whenever the policy issue at hand is either constitutional or redistributive, differentiation is not a viable solution. Conflict about the integrated policies that are fundamentally based on indivisibility, equality, and solidarity cannot be overcome by using this instrument. Um, the alternatives, if you deal with these issues, are either uniform integration or no integration at all. And the most likely outcome is actually no integration at all, blocked by those countries that refuse solidarity and fundamental values. And this is actually the outcome we've seen in post-crisis attempts to reform the Eurozone and the European Union's migration policy, as well and in, as in the EU's attempts to sanction Hungary and Poland and agree on a rule of law conditionality for the, for the budget. To overcome um, failed integration or non-integration in constitutional or redistributive policies, it just requires a major shock and reversal of interdependencies. So regime change in authoritarian countries, the surge of migration coming from a different geographic direction. And so let's assume that because of um, uh, developments in Eastern Europe, now Poland and Hungary would be massively affected by, by a migration surge. Uh, or uh, for a change require a major economic crisis in the, in the North rather than in the, in, in the South. Uh, I think both the Eurozone crisis and the corona pandemic demonstrate how such shocks and heightened interdependence may partially overcome obstacles to more solidarity. And the answers um, to these shocks were actually then uniform across the integrated policy. So in a historical perspective, differentiated integration has been an important instrument in the EU's most dynamic phase of policy and membership expansion. But as these processes slow down and reach their limits, uh, the heyday of differentiated integration may be passing too. Um, enlargement and external differentiation historically, the most important drivers of differentiation are now constrained by democratic backsliding and geopolitical conflict in the EU's environment, and also by the EU's concerns about future exit and cherry picking. There are just not many new and low level policies available for kickstarting through differentiated integration. And those highly integrated policies that require reform also require solidarity, burden, and risk sharing, for which differentiated integration is just counterproductive. So, in its current stage, the choice in European integration is actually between stagnation and possibly disintegration on the one hand and uniform integration, strengthening the constitutional foundations of the EU and its solidarity. Unfortunately, differentiated integration will not be of much help in evading this fundamental choice. And with that, I thank you for listening to me and looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, you've given us a huge tour d'horizon through uh, differentiated integration and uh, also very much a sober tour d'horizon in, I think, two respects. The first was to say differentiated integration mm -hmm. is not this catch-all solution to each and every problem. It's a bit unfortunate that you also showed us this kind of cycle of how scientific results enter into the policy process. You seem to have been saying a little bit, the Commission takes it up, it's a bit too late, you know, but. Uh, that's very unfortunate. But you also presented a, so, a sober uh, assessment of differentiated integration in the sense that you were saying, well, it's of no further usage and your two alternatives, either uniform integration or stagnation, seem to be biased quite a bit towards stagnation, you know. Um, but let me just ask you one question, uh, challenging your account a little bit about the the conditions under which differentiated integration is possible or not possible. I find your arguments very compelling that, for instance, redistribution is an issue because obviously a union among the poor doesn't very much help the poor because they need the money from the rich. Yeah? But the Eurozone Plus 
is it really so unrealistic to say, well, we could think of a Eurozone plus minus the frugal four, you know? It would still have a number of financially quite solid states and probably minus some of the big, big super risks, you know? So moderate diversity, some relatively well off states, some not so well off states. It could also be a union, if you think about uh, insurance, about states who have a little bit a longer time perspective where they say, yes, we're well off now, but probably what happens in 10 years, let's create the mechanism now. I know that this is not on the immediate political agenda, but why should it not work? The other example I'm giving is defense integration. I mean, a real military capacity. Is it really so unlikely that an exogenous shock leads? I mean, someone has said that NATO was brain dead, you know, and probably that person is not so wrong. So what would happen if the US would withdraw from NATO? You know, that would obviously, it's not completely outlandish anymore. It would be a huge shock. And either you can say, okay, we end up with uniform integration. That shocks everyone into the collective European army. Or we have a smaller group of countries joining this, whatever, without Denmark, if you wish, you know. I would say there is no big external effect. So it could work, at least in two major issue areas. That would be my questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think you're right to point out that um, my analysis has been has been rather blunt, yeah, but I, I want, really wanted to draw out, let's say, the, the major uh, conditions and, and, and paint it in a, in a rather, uh, rather stark color. So, yeah, of course, there is there is some leeway uh, here and here and there. But I mean, um, uh, say in the in the in the eurozone, um, let's say my. My major argument would be, yeah, um, if it had been possible in the way that you that you pointed out, why 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 haven't we seen it? Yeah, and um, uh, I mean the the dynamic is, I mean, let, let's assume uh, doing it without the Fugel four. I mean, the discussion we will have in Germany is okay if if. Um, um, uh, the Netherlands are not in there, Denmark, Sweden, Austria, Finland, yeah, as we've proven five now. Um, then that means, of course, yeah, that more of the burden will be placed on Germany's shoulders. Yeah? And, and that is, is actually uh, an, an additional disincentive yeah, for uh, uh, Germany to enter such, a, such an arrangement. And if you think back to pre-corona times, yeah, there was there was no movement whatsoever on the German side going in that direction. So, of, as I said, it requires major shocks, and the Corona pandemic has been such a shock that that shifts interdependencies, yeah, and and and, and changes also co coalitions. Yeah. But um, again, um, this has not led uh, to a major reshuffling of eurozone governments. It not it has not led to might, but it so far has not led to um, uh, the uh, instruments that have been proposed for the Eurozone to actually be imp imp implemented. Yeah? So um, I'm, I'm quite skeptical yeah, that uh, short of such shocks, there will be uh, these, these kind of arrangements. Again, with defense, I mean, of course, the the um, um, uh, death of NATO would be a major shock, yeah? and, and that again uh, changes major interdependencies and uh, major coalitions. And basically, all all bets are um, up, and um, uh, that would also ch uh, change. But I, 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 actually, as I said, the defense is an area where uh, the current level of integration is still so low that um, there is a lot of room yeah, for um, differentiation, um, 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 ex expanding what's what has been agreed so far at a very low level uh, within uh, PESCO in future years. Yeah? So this is, this is one of the areas where we still have, uh, have the possibility uh, to move ahead with um, differentiated integration anyways, even without this major shock. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would now like to open the floor for the discussion. I think I've seen one question, if I've seen that correctly. So could those of you who want to ask a question first, raise the hand and then 
come to the microphone, identify yourself briefly, and ask your questions. So you are first. No, no, just wait a second. He, one after one. Schönen guten Abend. Mein Name ist Christian Leubner. Vielen Dank für einen spannenden Vortrag. Ich würde auch gerne gehen in eins dieser beiden übrig gebliebenen Felder, über die wir sprachen, wo auch ich glaube, dass in allen beiden äh, zumindest eine spannende Diskussion möglich ist. Ähm, gerade in der Verteidigungspolitik äh, ist das äh, äußerst spannend, weil so widersprüchlich. Einerseits haben wir ja eine gemeinsame äh, Sicherheits- und Verteidigungspolitik. Andererseits sehen wir, dass diese gemeinsame Sicherheits- und Verteidigungspolitik in den letzten zehn Jahren, in den zehn Jahren, in, der sie, in, denen, in äh, denen sie tatsächlich existiert hat und funktioniert hat, immer weniger eine gemeinsame Politik ist. Warum? Weil ein großer Partner, der am meisten von gemeinsamer Verteidigung spricht, über diese zehn Jahre und auch heute noch, äh, sich gleichzeitig in den letzten zehn Jahren zunehmend aus diesen gemeinsamen Sicherheits- und verteidigungspolitischen Aktionen zurückgezogen hat, Frankreich nämlich. Äh, und äh, da wäre eine spannende Debatte äh, zu schauen, äh, wo, äh, wie die verschiedenen Initiativen, die wir von Seiten Macron sehen und auch die Reaktionen anderer großer Akteure, der Bundesrepublik zum Beispiel, worauf die hinauslaufen. Laufen die hinaus auf tatsächlich na, vielleicht verstärkte Zusammenarbeit und dann was für eine Art von verstärkter Zusammenarbeit? Nach Regeln äh, gemeinsamen Beschließens und Handelns oder nach Regeln äh, eines Joining the Leader? Ich war ich weiß gar nicht, ich spreche Deutsch hier einfach so unbefangen <lacht> statt Englisch. Wer werden wir treffen? Um, so, I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that for the moment. Thank you. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, speaking German. Um, sure. Yeah. So, uh, um, the question was again about uh, defense policy, external security policy, um, <laughs> and um, uh, about the uh, prospects uh, for the development of this policy area in a, in, in a situation where, as it was alleged, um, uh, France had consecutively uh, extracted itself uh, from, from this uh, common foreign and security uh, policy. Um, I think I don't quite share the premise here, <laughs> uh, that, that this has, that this has uh, uh, really happened. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's again a policy area where, can, where you can see quite different, I say, philosophies of differentiation uh, between Germany and uh, France. If you look at what uh, France had originally proposed as um, uh, its ideas for differentiation, these actually went far beyond uh, what has now been agreed in uh, uh, PESCO. I mean, uh, the French idea was really only to bring those countries together that could, um, that could make, a, make a difference, have the capacity, the capability and the willingness to uh, integrate uh, in the defense area much further. And basically, Germany hit the brake and said it's important that we keep almost all countries on 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 board so uh, i think if it if it uh if 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 the uh, uh, french government had its way what we would see is that say a, a more robust actually an intervention initiative yeah where countries with significant military capabilities uh join forces and leave those outside that have not much to can um tribute to this to this policy area Okay, I think we have one online question, then you're next. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, I, I'm slight. I'm a bit embarrassed because I came in late to your talk. I was confused about where the URL was. So I've only heard about half of it, and I apologize if this is redundant. But um, I, I did read all of uh, Nick Clegg's book. Uh, <laughs> and 
and where he uh, predicts that, that the conservatives he'd worked with would completely mess everything up with Brexit and there'd be a catastrophic failure and, and that this would be an opportunity to, to rewrite, you know, fund, foundational uh, mm -hmm. contracts of the European Union. To, so really an opportunity, which I understand is what you're addressing and saying this wasn't possible. And yet it seems clear that we have, to, we anyway have multiple levels of treaty, that there are people that have better and worse access. And that if, if, if there will be people like Ukraine and Turkey and the UK that will never be, you know, it's not that they can't be in Europe, it's that they can't not be next to their other neighbors. <laughs> and so, so the, the question is if, if we can somehow make it as costly as it must be to be on the outside or, or sort of in the uh, ring of electrons that's between two places, is it really that bad to offer even the, the possibility slash threat to these other nations that they might wind up with that same deal? Okay. Joanna Bryson from the Hertie School. Frank, we have the floor. Yeah, sorry, not to introduce myself, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, no, I, I, I mean, it's, 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 um, it's not bad at all. I, I think, I mean, from a, from a functional perspective, there's a, a, a lot to be, to be said for a, a, a Europe of concentric circles where uh, countries sort themselves in, into the circle yeah, that um, meets, uh, let's say, the uh, preferences of a majority of the uh, people, but also uh, res respects different levels of interdependence uh, with, the, uh, with the core European Union. Yeah? And I think uh, if you look at how the system has developed over time, I mean, uh, uh, still in the, in the early treaties, it was a binary choice, either you're a member or you're, or you're not a member. And uh, then with the treaties of Rome, there was the association status, but the European Union has been extremely in, inventive in um, designing ever new uh, um, circles around the core yeah, that would that would fit uh, the, uh, the the interests of, 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 of both parts um, but as I, as I said in my talk the assumption was well uh, as the EU you could be quite generous in opening up uh, yeah. the European Union to some of these policies because the basic assumption was well over time yeah, we will all come together in yeah. the European Union. Now, now of, of course, what the, what the EU has learned is that, that this, will not, um, this will not take place and um, uh, the uh, Brexit experience has, uh, has made the European Union much less generous and, and much less... No, much this is, the, this is exactly the point I came into the, to the yeah. lecture. I was very happy to hear you say that part. It, it was very clear. But surely now, um, what we've, what, what I've read at least, is that other countries are now saying, "Oh wow, we don't want to have be hit as badly as as Britain." So if we could come up with what the appropriate costs are, and and really make it quite clear that that still is, uh, yeah, uh, 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 there's a dis there's a distinction from being permanently in that sphere to being a, an entering. Uh, yeah. That, uh, so, so I, so I think that's a very strong rationale for the European Union to make that clear, and and I think uh, it, it it has had a it has has had a strong effect. I mean, uh, looking at the uh, Brexit ex experience, uh, you've seen many uh, Eurosceptic parties in the European Union actually changing from a let's follow the UK position to one okay let's reform the EU from the from the inside. Absolutely. Interestingly, for instance, both on the Swedish right and the Swedish left, uh, the original position to leave the European Union has been has been changed, and they have they do not cam campaign on that position anymore. So I so I think uh, this this has been a learning experience um, for uh, uh, Eurosceptics both outside and in, in inside the European Union, and uh, uh, puts. I mean, as I said, it. At the same time, it's, it will probably make this external differentiation much less flexible in the future as it, uh, than it had been in the past. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.
First of all, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my name is Asina Baikal and I'm an MIA second year student. And what I understood from your talk was that well, the motivation for why some people started a policy process that would lead to dif differentiated integration was to when we start now and we show all the other member states how well it functions, they will want to join, right? And I was thinking of how if you switch it and instead use it as a way to when you implement a policy to integrate people or to countries that want to be close to Europe, that want to be in the EU's concentric circle, um, that want to integrate to an extent to the EU because of different reasons, whether you can use differentiate, external differentiated integration as a form to spread best practices. And I was specifically thinking of, um, you know, a couple of years ago, Juncker was talking a lot about the European Energy Union and now the European Climate Law, I think, was um passed today or yesterday and um to what extent we could think about this is very speculative because the energy union isn't a thing yet but assuming a consolidated energy union in the future that we could think about integrating um non-european member states countries in the european neighborhood or accession accession candidates integrating them into european energy market and then spreading best energy practices, renewable energy, so on and so forth. Um, do you think that this is a prudent thing or is this one of those policy people who are trying to use differentiated integration for everything? Or, yeah, yeah. what would be okay on that? So I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, energy, but I can say more generally that, um, of course, these, this external differentiation and the concentric circles uh, have, have, have actually worked in in exactly the way that you that you mentioned. So for the for the core EU, uh, um, again under the assumption, yeah, that in the long run everybody wants to wants to join the, the, the European Union. It was basically said, yeah, we uh, de de depending on your capacities, on your level of uh, democratic consolidation, yeah, you can you can enter one of these concentric circles if you. Um, if you then learn, basically, yeah, and if you if you improve, yeah, then you can basically move to the to the to the next circle, and then if you like, all the way up to up to full membership. So that was um, that has traditionally been the idea, yeah, of this external di differentiation to create, uh, let's say, a a, a space uh, on the one hand for countries that wanted more integration but were in the eyes of the core EU, not ready, uh, or a space for uh, countries that never wanted to join the European Union, but, but still wanted to have a level of uh, participation in its, in its policies. Now, um, I think the, um, the, uh, that, that has worked as long as the EU um, has been open to new members and um, as long as uh, you would have, let's say, um, a credible progress yeah, in the adoption of, of, uh, of European norms and values in these countries. As I said, I mean, this, is, this has really stopped yeah, from, from, from both sides. Yeah? There's uh, extreme enlargements, skepticism. Now, what, what you refer to is actually a, a different model of differentiation, which is often called as a uh, Europe à la carte or multi-menu inter where you create um, uh, say different levels of integration in, in specific policy areas. Yeah? So uh, creating an energy union is not perceived yeah, uh, as a stepping stone towards further integration all the way up to membership. It's really a, a policy-specific uh, model of differentiation. I think you're right to point out that this, would, that this might actually um, also be a, um, uh, a future uh, to a trajectory of differentiated in, in integration in the EU when the path towards membership is blocked, yeah, but there are still uh, policy-specific incentives to work together. Um, but it, it would be interesting to see yeah, whether this would really create uh, more of this uh, a, la, a la carte Europe, where you have different policies with different memberships, um, which would be, which would actually be a, a, a break with the past and a new model of uh, differentiated integration. Whether that will come about, uh, we'll we'll have to see. But it would would also present some kind of a way out of the impasse yeah, that external uh, the differentiation is currently facing. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. We have the opportunity for one last question, and that is from you. Please. Hello. Um, my question is: uh, Did we did we reach maybe a critical mass of uh, constitutional or redistributive issues, where, um, as we could see it um, with the European recovery package, like even unrelated policy issues are now linked to those issues, and will we now be like arriving at a deadlock, or what is the way out of this deadlock, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I I think I can only repeat myself. Um, um, so the first thing I wanted to say is that differentiated integration is not the way out of this deadlock. This has been the way out of a deadlock under different conditions in the in the uh, past. It, it will probably not be the major way out um, uh, now uh, at, at this stage. So uh, I think in in recent years, what we have seen yeah, is, is indeed that under these conditions, the EU is mainly paralyzed. You know, there's there's not really a way forward. Uh, reforms are are, are stuck yeah, in the eurozone, in in migration policy, and uh, with regard to uh, rule of law issues, it's not really moving anywhere. The only way to get over this this paralysis, in in my view, is 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 really a major shock. You've you've mentioned the corona pandemic and how this has. Un, 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 unlocked yeah? uh, a few uh, dis discussions that the EU has had in the in the past, and is also now basically used yeah, to uh, uh, finance the uh, climate agenda, the digital agenda for which there had not been massive resources before, and which is which is now now used in that in that respect. But. Um, uh, but of course, it, it it doesn't seem to work. For instance, to overcome the deadlock in 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 my migration policy, yeah, this is still there. Uh, it, it it does not work to overcome the rule of law crisis in the European Union. Yeah, so so even this um, this uh, um, major shock and, and and what it has done is limited in the effects it has on on on, on these on these policy issues. Yeah, in these areas, I think um, the EU will be will be stuck uh, uh, with its paralysis for a long time. I mean, if you look at the new proposal that has been made for migration policy, yeah, which goes a long way in the direction of, um, of the uh, um, locking uh, countries in the East, yeah, but the first thing they uh, said, and even, even this minimal solidarity that is being asked of them, yeah, was uh, rejected out of hand. Yeah, the, in the first moment they, they heard about this proposal. Yeah, so um, it, I think it it doesn't just need uh, a, a, a general change in conditions, but they also have to be specific for the for the policy at hand and uh, for migration policy and the rule of law. We don't see that yet. Uh, maybe a quick follow-up, if yeah. I may. Um, uh, Orban recently proposed to opt out of the recovery package and forgo, I think, about 6.25 billion in grants. Um, is it a really is that a realistic option in your opinion? Uh, so I I must admit I haven't heard about this. Uh, him <laughs> opting out. Uh, why why would he do that? Uh, due to the rule of law conditionality. Yeah, but he has he has great means to uh, block the rule of, rule of law conditionality because it needs his. His uh, uh, vote yeah, to bring the recovery pack package into into reality. Yeah. So, I mean, if if I were Orban, I would not opt out of this policy, but I would do everything to block the rule of law conditionality linked to it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, Frank, for giving us your talk on the role of differentiated integration for the future of Europe. Although you didn't end on such an optimistic note, but a realistic note is probably an even better one. Thanks uh, to the audience here in the room and uh, on, on the web for listening to us and asking your questions. And it is up to me to invite you to a small reception outside where we can mix and mingle as good as we can under social distancing conditions. So thank you very much.
Thank you for joining. Thank you for the question.